After only 48 hours since coming into existence, the European Super League collapsed. The plan to create the breakaway European Championship had been concocted by billionaire club owners who assumed they held all the cards and who believed that by acting unilaterally, they could force the hands of the football association who opposed the move. How wrong they were and how pathetically incompetent they all now seem. Let's take a quick look at the sequence of events that led to this most dramatic of unravelings. We'll start. We're going to rush. We're going to go through this quite quickly, but it's it's worth running down. So on Sunday at midnight, the Super League was announced with no PR, no public appearance from anyone defending it, just a statement by three teams, each from Spain and Italy and Liverpool, Man United, Man City, Chelsea, Tottenham and Arsenal. You can see here the tweet from Liverpool. No one came out, as I said, no one came out to defend this, just a few tweets from a few clubs. However, while the owners supporting the plan were silent, the opponents of the Super League were not. By Monday morning, as we discussed on Monday's show, politicians, pundits and fan groups all came out against the Super League. And by the evening, it was the turn of the team's themselves live on Sky News after their game against Leeds. Liverpool manager Jurgen Klopp and vice captain James Milner were the first to express their opposition to the Super League. Jurgen, not too long ago you said you hoped there wouldn't be a Super League. What are your what are your thoughts? What are your feelings today? Didn't change. Didn't change since that. My feelings, my, my my opinion didn't change. Can I say my personal opinion? I don't I don't like it and you know hopefully it doesn't happen. Why don't you like it? What is it? What is it? For the same reasons as everyone else has been talking out over the last day. Obviously, it's been difficult for us with with our only game. Um, we try to prepare on the game, mm. um, but um, I can only imagine what's been said about it, um, and probably agree with most of it. Really strong statement there. On Tuesday, it was the turn of Chelsea's owners to hear the disquiet among the team and fans. Here's goalkeeper Petr Cech pleading with fans who had blockaded the team coach from entering the stand. Peter Cech there was saying, give us time, pleading with the fans, give us time for us to sort this out. And the fans didn't need to wait long. And the BBC Sports editor tweeted, I understand Chelsea are now preparing documentation to request withdrawing from the European Super League. And once um, one domino fell, they all began to collapse because not long after that, Manchester City followed suit. And then all six of the English teams had quit by midnight. As an example of the statements that came out, Arsenal tweeted, the following. As a result of listening to you and the wider football community over recent days, we are withdrawing from the proposed Super League. We made a mistake and we apologise for it. Most dramatic on, on Tuesday evening was that Manchester United's withdrawal came alongside the news that their chairman would resign with immediate effect, would, would had been due to resign at the end of the year, but the controversy over the Super League meant that decision was brought forward. Um, so a remarkable unravelling. Aaron, I want to know, were you surprised at how quickly this whole thing fell apart? I think everybody thought it would last longer, with the exception of you. I mean, I think, you know, your take was, your Insta analysis was, oh, this won't work. But what, what we knew on the night when the sort of story broke, which is on Sunday, was that contracts had been signed, that, you know, people were now in for a penny and for a pound. So you think, well, th there is no going back. And there's precedent there, you know, in the Champions League, which is you know the present elite competition amongst European football clubs, that was founded in a similar-ish way. It was expanded beyond just the winners of domestic leagues. That happened in a similar-ish way, right? So you can see you can see how unilaterally the biggest clubs try and take the game in a certain direction, but it's never been done like this. This unilaterally, with no consultation with players, with fans, with associations, UEFA, FIFA, the FA. Nobody, nobody knew about this. I, I, so it was, there was there was a kind of double feeling, right? On the one hand, well, people have signed documents. On the other hand, wow, we've never seen anything like this. How the hell can this go through? I didn't think it would fall apart in 72 hours, though, no. Well, what seemed so surprising, I suppose, is because, you know, on Monday when I had Ash on the show, we were talking about there's, you know, some game theory going on here. Who's going to fold first? Presumably, I assumed they wouldn't have done this. They wouldn't have launched the European Super League unless they put mm. in place the steps which would allow for it to happen because yes yeah. you know there have been dramatic 
developments since the announcement on Sunday, but they could kind of all have been predicted. None of them were surprising, but they, you know, they seemingly hadn't foreseen any of them. I, I don't understand what they expected to happen that would have been different from what actually did happen. So I have to disagree with you there slightly. Because what I don't think they foresaw was the intervention of politicians in the way that we did we did see. So Boris Johnson comes out very quickly. You know, he's saying, I will use a legislative bomb to stop this from happening. He was saying, I will, you know, impose uh, potentially new legislation. He didn't say this explicitly. That was, you know, th that's the pretext, um, or the pretext, the subtext. I will impose legislation whereby you would lose equity in these football clubs because he would introduce something like 50 plus one in, in Germany, where actually fans have majority of equity in the football clubs, effectively expropriation. Now, that may just have been rhetorical, but if you're Abramovich or if you're, you know, uh, you know, the sheikhs at the top of Manchester City, you think, I don't need this, right? This is a really valuable asset. I don't need this. You've got the You've got a bidding war, or bidding war almost between the leader of the opposition, the prime minister, about who can sort of bring football back to the people. You've got Prince William tweeting about how it's not acceptable. And I think at a certain point, those kinds of political interventions probably did rattle people. And even yesterday, you saw it in the statement that came out from Manchester United. There's been pushback from fans, uh, from, from players. And I think they did say explicitly from, from government. And I think the government bit was the bit they didn't expect. And, and this is folded in the way that it has because of the six English clubs, not because, you know, they're so, you know, wonderful and they're so much more enlightened than the other clubs, but for two reasons, really. Firstly, the Premier League is already very lucrative. You know, AC Milan, Inter Milan, Juventus need this a lot more than the English clubs do. Their debt piles aren't quite as big, but at the same time, you know, they're not making as much money as they would like. Uh, and then secondly, what was super interesting was that the, the fans most opposed to this tended to be fans of English clubs. And the only club whose fans supported the European Super League, and by a tiny slither of majority, was Juventus, like 52-48. But for all the English clubs, you know, it was a tiny minority that wanted this whatsoever. So I think the absence of consent from fans, the intervention of politicians, and the fact that the Premier League is already so lucrative, I don't think the incentives lined up for them. Even though some clubs really did need this to happen. They looked at the European Super League as a kind of bailout. Manchester United and Tottenham in particular are facing massive, massive debt piles and they really need this to happen because, you know, the, the Champions League is not bringing in enough money for them to kind of continue as they are. Same applies to Real Madrid, which is why Florentino Perez has been the kind of the driving force with this whole thing. So many dynamics at work. But what's really instructive is that the two English clubs that broke first were Manchester City and Chelsea. And of course, they're the two clubs that are sort of independently wealthy. You know, they're not based on shareholders and debt leverage buyouts and loans from JP Morgan. They're owned by, well, one's, you know, an astronomically wealthy Russian oil oligarch. The other one is a sheikh, uh, you know, from the Arabian Peninsula, effectively a sovereign state that's involved in Manchester City, like with Paris Saint-Germain. So there are a lot of dynamics at work. Uh, and I think that's why that's why the English clubs, you know, pulled away first. The moment the weakest links fell, the whole edifice crumbled, right? The moment Manchester City and Chelsea, who didn't really need it, dropped out, the whole thing fell apart. Apparently, Chelsea and Man City weren't that keen to sign up in the first place. They were incredibly angry um, at the other clubs who'd launched it because... I think, I mean, the subtext for me seemed to be that they assumed that those clubs had kind of sorted out some sequence of events that would make this thing actually happen. They signed up because they didn't want to be left out of it. And they assumed that the Manchester United's and the Juventus's and the Real Madrid's had sort of worked out a way to make this work. And they clearly hadn't. I want to focus on the players for a second. Um, we showed you a couple of clips of Petr Cech and James Milner. Um, they weren't the only players to speak out against this before um, the whole thing collapsed. Um, Manchester United's Marcus Rashford tweeted this image, which says, football is nothing without fans. It's a quote from Sir Matt Busby. And then Liverpool players put out this collective statement at 9pm. So this was a statement they all agreed with each other. We don't like it and we don't want it to happen. This is our collective position. Our commitment to this football club and its supporters is absolute and unconditional. You'll never walk alone. Um, Aaron, you've sort of said, you know, that, the politicians getting involved was one of the unforeseen things by the by the owners. I mean, I think they probably could have foreseen that because, you know, if the fans hate it, the players hate it, the managers hate it, then there's a real opportunity for politicians to to come in and and also hate it. 
But the, I mean, uh, the collective action among players was really interesting because I think what many people assumed was, look, these these people won't bite the hand that feeds them. They're essentially paid by, um, well, either these oligarchs or these businessmen who, who wanted to join the Super League, but they came out and felt able and willing to speak out against it. Were you surprised at how, I suppose, vocal players and managers were? Yeah, that's super interesting. And again, that's another, you know, stakeholder, uh, which which wasn't consulted. And I, I think you're right. I think, you know, that they certainly wouldn't have seen what has happened. I think a lot of it does boil down to changes in technology. And I think particularly with the Glazers, you know, Manchester United was purchased by Malcolm Glazer. He completed the purchase of Manchester United in 2005. And that, you know, presaged huge, pro huge protests, massive protests, the biggest protests that, you know, I think to this day, I think they're the biggest protests we've seen in, in sort of elite English football. I could be wrong, maybe I've, I'm forgetting something, but I think they're the big, they were just gi giant protests. You know, a whole new club, you know, um, FC United was founded out of out of those protests. And, and it's a perfectly successful, you know, uh, sort of non-league club. It's, it's doing pretty well lower down the football pyramid. And I think, well, they thought 2005, yeah, there was loads of kickback, but ultimately we, we managed to get through that and we bought a club for 800 million. It's now worth 4 billion. You know, that was definitely a win for us. We've taken a billion pounds out of the club ever since, you know. Uh, we managed to buy it with loans guaranteed against the assets of the club we were buying. Wow. I mean, it's almost criminal when you think about the Glazers' purchase of Manchester United, but, you know, they, they managed to get through it. And I, I presume there was a sort of, a recency bias, right? Which is the last time we did something this absurd. We got away with it and it was very lucrative for us. So why will this time be any different? Well, this time is different because I think of technology, social media, and I think the players lost their inhibitions because they saw Twitter, they saw Instagram, and then of course you're seeing television. And it helps that, you know, Sky had a vested interest in screwing this up probably. I mean, maybe not. I mean, maybe Sky would have, you know, still bid for the TV rights. I don't, you know, I don't know the, people have said that, but I, that's difficult to qualify, but they certainly didn't want it to go ahead. And so you've got on Monday Night Football, Gary Neville and Jamie Carragher, who are very established figures in football punditry saying these things. You've got BBC pundits saying something similar on Sunday night. So if you're a player, you're looking at the pundits, you're looking at the fans, you're just getting abuse on your Instagram account whenever you sort of say it or do anything. And so I think that does take the inhibitions away and it's a very different context 2005. Free social media, you know, pre-YouTube, pre pre-Twitter, pre-Instagram. And, and again, I think that's where the Glazers fell apart. And people say, well, well surely they foresaw this. You know, I. I I think we really shouldn't overestimate the extent to which these people are detached from reality. The Glazers look at Manchester United. I can't speak for John Henry in Liverpool or any of the others. I think John Henry actually doesn't apply to him whatsoever. He did a he did a relatively impressive, I think, the bare minimum groveling apology, you know, but he's the only one to really do that. But the Glazers are completely detached from reality. They are American, they are the children, the princelings of an American sports billionaire who really don't know their ass from their elbow, never worked a day in their lives, and look at this football club like a piggy bank. And they thought that this deal with the Super League would make that piggy bank even bigger. And I think their eyes grew bigger than their, their capacity to, to fight this fight. Their father was around the last time, he wasn't now. So a bunch of things at work, but I, I think the big, big, big one is how we conduct these debates. The capacity for collective action growing out of social media just wasn't there 15 years ago. And it makes you think, you know, would the Glazers have been able to buy Manchester United in 2005? I would wager after the last week, looking at what's happened, no, they would not.